Um, we'll be talking about the science and clinical application of placental and dermal tissue to accelerate healing, specifically in um, lower extremity ulcers. So as I mentioned, we have a phenomenal team of experts at your disposal who are going to be sharing both some um, basic science and clinical data as well as case studies today. You can see our disclosures there. Of course, we all take responsibility for said disclosures. And then, of course, our learning objectives for today. So we're going to start with just some basic clinical information, kind of going through what lower extremities ulcerations look like, what we need to be looking at, because fundamental to the success of any product um, and fundamental to our patient success is making sure that we're taking good care of our patients as a whole. Right, so we're gonna start with just some basic information, go through some things, and then we'll look to look at the product specifically. So when we look at the epidemiology of lower extremity ulcers, you can see there what we're looking at. High cost burden, high morbidity, high mortality, which we'll talk about moving forward. We know that greater than 5% of those who are over the age of 80 will have a lower extremity ulceration. Used to be that we might think, well, they're 80 years old, what do you expect? But for the most part nowadays, we have a lot of 80-year-olds who are walking around in the community very active. So very important to make sure um, that we're considering that and looking at it from a prevention standpoint as well. We know that venous leg ulcers comprise about 80 to 90 percent, again looking at different sources of data of all of our lower extremity ulcers. We'll emphasize throughout today that we all know that these things do not occur in a vacuum. So you could have a lower extremity ulceration that is ischemic or arterial in nature but also has a venous component um, and vice versa. Diabetic foot ulcers are the most common cause of foot ulcerations but it's really important to also look at arterial ulcers, pressure ulcers on the foot, um, and atypical ulcers, which we're gonna talk about moving forward as well. So looking at our venous leg ulceration specifically, um, you can read there the epidemiology and stats, but what I wanna focus on um, is essentially the six month healing rate. We know that venous leg ulcers are extremely difficult to close. They require complex and multidisciplinary care. Um, and when we look at our recidivism rates at 12 months and up to five years, they're very high. So very important that we take really good care of the patient as a whole and we look to prevent that recurrence. Um, the other thing about venous leg ulceration, similar to most of the wounds that we're treating, they can be treated in a multitude of settings. Um, which is a really great thing from the multidisciplinary standpoint, but also poses a risk with regard to discrepancies in care. So you guys being here today and being at this conference, really great because it charges us as clinicians moving forward to make sure that we're implementing that standard of care. I think we're all fairly familiar with the mortality rates in diabetic foot ulcerations. We also know that diabetic foot ulcers and amputations are markers of our patient's overall health. By the time a patient has an ulcerated foot in the setting of diabetes, we know that they are fairly sick, correct? We have most of our patients with seven or more comorbid factors. Um, so this is where our limb salvage techniques come in and involving um, the advanced modalities that we have topically, like we're gonna talk about today, to assist in that limb salvage effort. Peripheral artery disease, so we're looking at our ischemic ulcers. There is a place for advanced topical modalities, even in this setting, of course, with proper revascularization when possible. Um, the peripheral artery disease, we know risk factors, renal disease, diabetes, age, genetics. Um, and again, making sure that as we look at our lower extremity ulcers in general, we are ruling out that arterial component. Um, before we look to employ advanced modalities, making sure that we're getting at a minimum, and most of you guys said that you do have access to some sort of um, ability to test vascularly, but making sure that we're ascertaining that arterial circulation uh, before we proceed with some of our advanced modalities. So again, us being here today, um, you know, we know what we're, we should be doing for these patients, but unfortunately there remains a pretty wide research to practice gap, meaning we have those care standards, um, but as clinicians, we're not doing a very phenomenal job following through with those when we look at total contact casting in the diabetic foot, adequate compression in the venous leg, revascularization in the arterial cir circumstances. Um, so it really does, again, charge us with making sure we're taking care of the whole patient. We're determining that primary etiology and managing that, especially as we look to utilize our advanced modalities. 
So again, our typical patients, you can see there, you guys are treating this every single day, very complex patients. Um, always important and appropriate to make sure that we are looking at their comorbid factors, working with other specialists, primary care doctors on risk factor management, um, making sure that we're mitigating everything that we can prior to proceeding with some of the more advanced modalities. Another super important to, thing to think about, especially when we're looking at lower extremity ulceration, is a differential diagnosis. I think as wound care clinicians, oftentimes we walk in the room and we're so sure of ourselves because we do this every day, we say, that's a venous leg ulcer. But we have to be very careful with that because there are many things that will either occur concurrently or that will mimic other types of ulcerations. So you can have a patient with pyoderma gangrenosum with a lower extremity ulcer and still have a venous component. You can have a venous leg ulcer and have a malignancy. Um, so it's very important not to narrow in too quickly and make sure that you're really looking at the whole picture and taking a step back, which we'll review a little bit moving forward also. Um, you can see there, I'm not gonna belabor this, but I wanted to use this as a resource and a reference. This tool has helped me, so if you want, grab that, that reference. Um, looking at some of the other lower extremity ulcer etiologies. Again, as we're employing these awesome topical modalities that we're gonna talk about today, if we don't address the underlying cause of the ulcer itself, nothing that we put on the wound is going to assist. Um, so to optimize the success of our patients and our products, we have to make sure that we're considering that. Another great tool from the same reference um, kind of helps me differentiate what I'm looking at. I have gone back to these, knowing what an arterial ulcer is generally going to look like, knowing when to work up for the venous um, side of things. So again, another good reference and resource there. We talked about many of the systemic comorbidities and factors. These are things that, again, as wound care clinicians, we are not necessarily primarily going to be managing, but very important, you know, oftentimes we're seeing these patients more than any of their other specialists. So we have that patient captured. We have them at our disposal. Uh, so making sure that we're, we're doing everything we can to pick up on some of these other factors, help our other clinicians um, manage the patient as a whole. So how I kind of look at that, um, and as we're looking into getting into talking about some of these really great advanced modalities that we're gonna talk about today, I kind of see my assessment or my managing of the wound patient in three stages. The first stage to me, extremely important, we have to take a good history and physical. Um, with regard to that, I love the medication reconciliation. That's a window to your patient's soul. Um, oftentimes patients come in and I say, hey, do you have any autoimmune disorders? And they say, nope. And I say, do you see a rheumatologist for anything? Nope. And then I go look at their med list and they're on methotrexate, right? So, you know, do, do you have diabetes? Nope, sure don't, I don't have that sugar. You go and look at their med list, they're on metformin. Okay, so I really use that medication reconciliation very seriously. That can also help us in our diabetic and PAD patients, making sure that they're on their stat and that they're taking aspirins, that we're getting those risk factor medications taken care of. Stage two is kind of what we're gonna talk about today where we start to pull in the needed specialists that, that we need. Um, and we look to use some of these advanced topical modalities. And then stage three, I think of it as a feedback loop. We should always be circling back around to stage one. What's changed? Is this wound healing? If it is, great. If it is not, then why not? Um, so this is kind of that negative feedback or positive feedback loop where if we're not seeing results with the, the topical modalities that we're using, we need to step back to stage one. Okay, so in theory, this should all be fairly easy, right? We know we need multidisciplinary care, um, but executing that is a different story. So again, I'm not going to belabor um, a whole lot, but I do want to offer that there are a lot of studies out there that show that multidisciplinary care is very important, um, and that involving wound care specialists as vascular surgeons, as plastic surgeons, as general surgeons is extremely, extremely important. Um, so one of the studies, Journal of Vascular Surgery 2020, essentially sh shows this, that we have reduced amputation rates when we involve our wound care specialists. Um, one of the things that I got out of this study is that it's really great to have some sort of a care navigator who can help us watch what's going on with the patient as they traverse the system among settings, um, tracking benefit verifications, tracking the healing of the wound as the patient ends up in ER, that one or two people who can kind of keep track of where that patient is and make sure that we're keeping everybody involved. Similar study in angiology in 2015 shows that we can not only reduce the amputation rates but improve quality of life when we involve our wound care specialists. Similar um, 2017, an algorithm this was focusing um, primarily on critical limb ischemia, an algorithm that was developed to kind of help us uh, navigate that multidisciplinary care. Similar study here, 
Um, and then lastly, I do kind of want to emphasize the other aspect of things, which we're often shy to talk about. Uh, this was actually a study done by the SVS in 2019 that showed even financial benefit to having a wound care program within a vascular surgery practice. So we can grow our practices and reach more patients um, when we work together. Important to define your team, like I talked about. Um, define the roles on the team. Again, as we look to employ these advanced modalities, we want to make sure that there are people who can kind of keep track of that and make sure that we're using them optimally. And then one of my favorite quotes, which I'm not even sure from where this originated, but a chronic wound is an acute wound with an impediment. And unfortunately, too often the impediment may be the treating, we now need to insert nurse, NP, APP, you know, whoever's treating that wound. So we're glad that you guys are here with us today because this is how we start eliminating us as that impediment to our patient's wound healing. Okay, so with that, I leave you with Dr. Galliano, who's going to go through some of the, the data, and we'll start to talk about the products that we're here specifically to learn about today. So as Dr. Bauer just said, I think what makes us uh, good clinicians is essentially, it's not good intentions, and we all have good intentions. We all want to do the best for our patients. But really what brings us into, I think, the realm of being really, really good clinicians is, is basically having a data, science-based approach to the care of our patients. And as, as Dr. Bauer said, these are the most complex patients. I treat a lot of different types of, do a lot of different types of surgeries in my practice. It, my practice is all, you know, bread and butter plastic surgery, cosmetic surgery, breast reconstruction, microsurgery. But the ones that keep me up at night are my wound patients. And, and it's, it really does take a whole team to do this. So in terms of moving past good intentions, let's look at the science. And how many of us have actually used acellular products in our, in our patients? I assume most of us? OK. So the, you know, when I started looking at um, decellularized products, matrices, way back when I was a resident in the early 2000s, um, I didn't believe them. I thought, you know, why would I put a dead piece of skin on a wound? It's going to get chewed up. It's not going to work. It's a passive matrix. It's just not going to do anything. And, and this is what kind of led me to think that there's something to this, and I think to us. And again, this is a paper, uh, colleagues at um, Chuck Zellin and, and others, looking at a, a, a aseptically processed dehyd dehydrated um, amnion chorion membrane and look, did a study with 80 patients in diabetic foot ulcers. And as you can see from the data graphs, this is a clinical trial. And remember, clinical trials are artificial. They're not real life. These are patients that are selected. In general, patients in clinical trials, because they get really good care, even the control group tends to do very well or better than real life clinical patients. And so this is the time of healing over time of, a clinic of patients with DFUs. And starting out around day week four, starting to see improvement in healing, around 30% healing um, uh, by, by 12 weeks after uh, in initiation of the intervention. But look at the curve of the patients treated with the uh, amniotic uh, chorionic membrane matrix. Uh, you see an early jump uh, even at, after one week. And by about 12 weeks, about an 80% healing rate, uh, the difference between from 30 to 80%. So this is obviously a huge improvement and something that I really have not seen before this uh, in managing these patients. This is essentially a diff slightly different way of looking at this. This is with dermis now. If you looked at the patients in, this, in a different study at six weeks, patients treated with uh, standard of care, there were, um, there were um, uh, this, sorry, this is, this is reversed. Patients treated with a standard of care here, very few patients had healing um, at uh, six weeks. However, even at six weeks, about 60%, 70% of patients already had a completely closed wound in a diabetic foot ulcer. So this is a different way of looking at that same data, again, over 12 weeks. Similar kind of kinetics of closure. Um, at 12 weeks, about 80% healing rate with a decellularized dermal matrix compared to standard of care in patients with chronic diabetic foot ulcers. Again, high number of patients, very well controlled study, very, very well executed scientifically. And, and, if, and those are diabetic foot ulcer studies. Well, what about our other patients? For example, venous ulcer patients, which I think we've already heard can take up to seven, six to seven months to heal. 
And you saw a similar improvement in healing rates. Again, 20 to 30% healing rates at week 12 in patients with standard of care, and a similar improvement of 70% at three months with treatment with these decentralized products in addition to excellent wound care. So there's something to this, obviously. And, and, and we could end here and just say, okay, well, let's start putting in patients. And, and I think, but I think like any good study, if you actually look at the data, it raises as many questions as it answers. And this tells us that there's something to this, right? This just tells us that these products are going to be useful. Uh, it kind of confirms what a lot of us have seen in our clinical practice. But the question, of course, is why? How do we get here? What is, what is going on? And, and is there a difference, for example, now with the plethora of products in, that are decentralized, different companies, different ways of processing? Is there a difference scientifically with how they behave at, at the federal level? So, this, I'm a scientist as well, I run a basic science lab, and, and so when I started thinking about this, I approached MTF and we started saying, let's look at this in terms of a, 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 a mechanistic study. How are these uh, wounds actually uh, healing, um, and what is the mechanism of how they're healing? Uh, we could have done this in humans and doing, done things like RNA sequencing, et cetera, but the problem with humans as experimental subjects is we're outbred animals. We have a lot of variability. And so if you want to really study and hone in on mechanisms, sometimes an animal model can be very in, in instructive. So what we did was we took our diabetic um, mouse model, and, and this is the DBDB um, uh, uh, leptin receptor deficient mouse model. And you can argue whether this models diabetes or obesity or inflammation. I would argue probably it models all of those. Um, and so it's not a pure diabetic model, but I think like a lot of our patients who are not purely diabetic or also obese, et cetera, highly inflamed wounds, it really models that very, very nicely. Um, jump to the chase, we published several papers, and, and, and you can ask me for the references. Um, but this essentially was the model. We did a splinted model, so it minimizes contraction. So this allows wounds to heal like humans' wounds, low extremity wounds heal for the most, mostly by new tissue and growth, not so much contraction. Um, and when we looked at this, this is kind of the model. This is just a little bit of background in terms of you know, what we're doing, what our materials and methods are. The nice thing about the splinted model is that this is a non-diabetic mouse model. If you don't splint the wound, most wounds heal by between eight days and eight, eight to 10. This is a six millimeter wound on the back of a mouse. If you splint it, you extend the healing to around day 16, 14 to 16. Diabetic mice heal slower. If you don't splint the wound, they heal by about 60, day 16, 18. But if you splint it, you can extend the time to healing to about 24 days. And what's nice about this model is by extending the time to healing, not only does it model the human's impaired chronic wounds, but also you can tease out deltas, differences, uh, in, a, in a better fashion than you can if you, things will heal within one week. Um, so again, uh, I know all of us know pretty much about this, you know, the wound healing cascade, so I won't belabor this. What I really want to know is that is, is in order to understand you know, what goes you know, right, it's what goes wrong with something, you have to understand, understand what, what goes right. So in other words, if you want to fix an engine, you have to know how an engine works, right? You can't just go in there and with good intention try to fix an engine unless you really understand what is, what is normal about something. And the same thing goes with wound healing. And just to recall, wound healing is an orderly cascade and it should heal with inflammation, clear bacteria after an injury. Cells should grow into the wound, proliferate, form new blood vessels, lay down um, you know, fibroblasts and monocytes. And then over after that gets deposited and, and wounds re you should have remodeling of the scar such that you restore some sort of architectural normalcy to the wound healing process. The problem is, is this is the problem in our wounds. The inflammatory process, for a variety of reasons, is excessively prolonged. And this is what really sets a cascade for delaying healing in most of our patients. So, Again, if we want to figure out how to, what we ideally we want to improve in terms of a product or an intervention, we want to really assess what it is that we want to achieve. So again, if, if when I have a patient with a big chronic wound and, and, and it's a plastic surgeon, I want to fix it with a surgical operation, I will ask my residents, you know, tell me, start work backwards. What is it you want to have at the end? And let's work backwards and think of ways to achieve that, try to get there to that final step. It may that may take two to three operations or processes, but that's kind of a nice way of thinking about how to achieve, um, get to where you want to be.
So at the end of the day, we want to have basically a product. We want to have processes that support granulation tissue formation, vascularization. We want to make sure that the granulation tissue that's deposited, it's like a soil. You can't grow a garden unless the soil is good. But if the soil is good, then you can have the cells, the epidermis, crawl across the granulation tissue and complete the wound healing process. Um, it turns out that most non-healing wounds are characterized by excessive inflammation, lack of granulation tissue oxygen, lack of oxygenation, and that's why whether it's a venous ulcer, a pressure ulcer, a radiated wound, there's commonalities to all of these. And that's why we don't have to have 10 different products for 10 different types of wounds. We can use these matrices in any one of these chronic wounds. And so it's better, I think, in some ways to be a lumper, not a splitter. Look for the commonalities that prevent wounds from healing, and then try to address those um, as well. Um, so this is what we essentially ended up doing, is we started looking in our animal model at two different matrices. We looked at the matrix with the amion and chorion uh, matrix, um, uh, and we also looked at decelerized dermis. And if you look at different processes in terms of wound healing, inflammation, angiogenesis, proliferation, granulation tissue deposition, re and so differentiation, remodeling, and anti-scarring, this is what we essentially found. And I'm going to go over the next slides of how we, the data that shows this. But this shows that, number one, is that they are very, very effective at affecting each of these different processes for the most part. It turns out that there are differences. Dermal matrices are probably different than amniotic membrane matrices. And maybe as clinicians, this may give us clues as to when to use these, how to use these, how, perhaps how often to use these on the road uh, through these studies. This is kind of the methods we used to, and I won't belabor that. Um, these are the assays that we use in our in mouse model to uh, look at this. So let's look at, the, let's look at the dermal tissues. Again, what we're going to show is basically that these are really good for cell proliferation, for re and for um, and for remodeling of the matrix. Um, so this is the design of the study. We made incisional, uh, excuse me, excisional wounds on the back of a mouse. We splinted at it, and we harvested the wounds and looked histologically at day seven and day fourteen. And that's a very kind of very rigorous way of assessing healing, not just visually looking at a wound, which you can, actually is kind of tricky but actually looking histologically with system morphometry and looking at really good statistics. And what I really want to highlight in this is looking at epithelialization. How, how fast does the epidermis crawl across this matrix? Um, so this is a wound, and this is how it looks like without the matrix at day seven. These dark cells have been stained for keratin, a parent keratin marker, and you can see that at day seven and day 14 in the diabetic mouse model, there's really just not a lot of healing. These are stawed, delayed. There's a little bit of healing in, in, uh, inwards. But if you look at the wounds treated with this matrix, and this is the matrix in the middle right here, kind of smack in the middle, these are the cells that have crawled across the matrix at day seven. You can see there's a, quite a robust amount of migration of the epidermis across the matrix at day seven, and a complete restoration of the epidermal layer by day 14. Uh, this is a different way of looking at it. Essentially, the smaller the, the gap between the wounds, so this is better healing than this, and this is the, the wound, these, these are the wounds treated with the dermal matrix at day seven, and by day 14, almost complete closure in a very, very impaired model. This is a different aspect of looking at, essentially looking at glass half full versus glass, glass half empty. So essentially, it's empty for the, um, for, the deceler, for the wounds treated with standard of care with no matrix, but with the dermal matrix by day 14, you saw almost complete, half of the wounds were completely re -epithelized. Of course, cells can migrate, but they can also proliferate. And so what they showed is that the, cell, the matrix, if you looked at a, keratin, uh, sorry, a proliferation marker, um, you see more staining, more brown staining in the wounds at the, in the epidermis at the leading edge treated with the matrix. So there's something in the matrix, growth factors, maybe it's something else, that is enhancing proliferation of the epidermis just when you need it the most. And this is what essentially accounts for the rapid proliferation and essentially migration over the, over the, over the dermis. Um, so you would think that if you, you see a lot of healing in the epidermis, you probably would see a lot of healing in the underlying cells, the granulation tissue, the, the fibroblasts, the, um, and, the, um, and all those cells. And it was fascinating, though, is that it, we actually show the opposite. Um, and I'll get into what this seeming paradox is. So if you look at the amount of granulation tissue, there's not a lot of healing into the matrix at day seven right here. So um, you see a little bit more on, on day 14, 
But it seems that these, this matrix is able to support at this time point reepithelialization without necessarily having a lot of tissue ingrowth or sorry new new vessel sorry new cells growing into the wound. Um, and the reason for this is probably has to do with the fact that the cells don't have to uh, proliferate. There is a matrix, it's a home, they're actually moving into the house as opposed to having to build and construct a house, which is what our wounds do. By placing this matrix, we're essentially allowing for the cells to essentially just move and migrate into this without having to have an excessively re redundant amount of uh, cellular ingrowth that we see in most of our chronic wounds. And again, Wound healing is an energy dependent process. The less the body has to do, especially in our malnourished, elderly, chronically ill patients, the faster healing can proceed. So, and I think this supports that. Um, we also looked at uh, genetic markers, um, looking at um, uh, molecular signals that are important for granulation tissue formation. And again, we saw a similar trend in these areas. So we've looked at things like fibroblast growth factor, connected tissue growth factor, um, collagen, um, transforming growth factor beta, TGF beta one. I thought initially that I would see a much higher degree of these with the dermal matrices. That's what we think. We think more is better. Sometimes it's not. Um, it turns out that you can get healing in, 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 with less, you can, in other words, you can do more with less in this regard. So you saw with, with the matrix, which is in green versus orange in standard of care, in all of these genes that were studied, you saw less of expression of this. And what this means is that we're not seeing the hallmark of the body's healing response, which is essentially forming a lot of tissue, excessive tissue that gets pruned away from the scar. What we're probably seeing is more of a regenerative phenotype, where basically you, you provide the matrix, the cell body does not have to produce an excessive amount of growth factors or scar. The collagen is there, so the body doesn't have to form more collagen uh, to migrate into. And that's how, what we're, we're seeing here as well. Um, and if you look at cell proliferation, uh, and this is done in vitro, we, add, we put the matrixes in a tissue, a tissue dish, added fibroblast on it, and what you could see is that it, both, the matrix supported not only granulation um, proliferation of these fibroblasts, so you see a lot more cells at, at, day, at, day, at day seven and day 14, but you also saw more secreted proteins as, uh, of collagen four, which are important for, uh, to allow cellular ingrowth and, and migration into the wound um, as, as well. Um, we, looking at blood vessel deposition or angiogenesis, which is an important part of healing. What's nice about this slide is it shows essentially with CD31 staining, which is a marker for endothelial cells, you saw that you saw a, there is a robust uh, amount of staining um, of cellular uh, uh, ingrowth in the matrices in vitro uh, in these dermal matrices. In other words, these are friendly toward endothelial cells. Endothelial cells like living in them, they like migrating in them. And what this next slide shows is that by day 14, you're seeing this is a three-dimensional fluorescence cast of the blood vessels. You can start seeing that you have these tubular matrices that are present. Uh, this shows the nuclei as well as the matrix that basically recapitulate uh, basically blood vessels. And what, so what's happening is this is too soon. A body really can't form robust, mature blood vessels by day 14. What this is really showing is that these cells you know, are migrating into the casts of the vessels that were present in these decellularized products, essentially relining the channels. Um, and that's probably one reason why these uh, matrices are also very good for uh, robust healing, is they decrease the amount of time that you need to form ro uh, mature, functional blood vessels, um, in, 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 not only in vivo, but in vitro as well. So in summary, if you kind of break it down, if looking at this dermal matrix product, decellularized dermal matrix product, what we're showing here is that you see a very rapid, robust epithelization, um, even in the absence of a significant amount of granulation tissue formation. And that seems to be enough for, uh, to allow healing uh, at an earlier time point than you would otherwise have without this matrix. Um, the matrix does get revascularized. It supports new tissue and growth in terms of endothelial cells. And it decreases the amount of fibrotic proteins and, and increases remodeling. So, what about placental tissues? Um, I think these are probably more commonly used amniotic products and things sort of like this. And, and this, again, cutting to the chase, looking at the decellularized amnion chorion membrane, um, what we're going to show is that it basically decreases inflammation, increases proliferation, increases granular tissue formation, as well as angiogenesis. 
It enhances reproduction, although to a lesser extent than the dermal product does, and seems to be antifibrotic to a remarkable degree. So same similar design, applying the, uh, making the wounds in the back of the mice, uh, treating once, some with the matrix and some with the other, with, with, without it, and harvesting at day seven and at day 14. So um, I mentioned inflammation. Um, inflammation consists of neutrophils and monocytes or macrophages. Um, for a lot of our chronic wounds, it's the cells that are stuck in inflammatory phase. We want to look at not only the amount of number of monocytes, but also the types of monocytes. And it turns out, I think we all know this, there are good monocytes, M2 macrophages, which are considered regenerative, and there's M1 macrophages, which are considered pro-inflammatory. For example, patients with uncontrolled sepsis, this is what you'll see in the bloodstream a lot. Um, and this is what you see a lot in our chronic wounds. You see a highly uh, abundant expression of M1 macrophages. So looking at the ratio, in other words, you can get a more of a regenerative phenotype at either increasing the M2 macrophages or decreasing the M1 macrophages. Looking at the ratio is very important. So this is a wound. Basically, you have an injury. You have, once you have an injury, you have lack of blood vessels in the wound. Um, you have inflammation because, we, because bacteria gets into every single wound. Neutrophils come in, they mop up the bacteria. By reducing the uh, presence of bacteria, that allows the cells to keep going forward towards healing, you get angiogenesis, and you get a resolved healed wound. What happens in a chronic wound, and chronic wounds can be chronic because of inflammation, ischemia, diabetes, vascular disease, a lot of different reasons. But whatever it is that's impeding the wound, it, it basically allows bacteria to proliferate. And it's this kind of in, augmented inflammation, kind of out of control inflammation, that kind of perpetuates a vicious cycle. So more inflammation causes more tissue damage, more tissue damage causes more ischemia, more ischemia causes more bacteria to grow, allows more bacteria, and basically you have this uncontrolled loop. And so uh, as clinicians, our job is to find some way to short circuit this vicious cycle and allow the wounds to go back to this kind of cycle of healing and resolution. Um, so looking at applying a decelerized amnion core matrix, basically we're seeing at, at an early time point you saw a reversal in the ratio. So in other words, if you have standard of care, you have this much of degree of the ratio, of, uh, sorry, this much of M1s, um, and with the amniocron, it reduces it significantly, um, and this is statistically significant. You, you see a slight increase in M2 in those sites, but this was not statistically significant, but it's the ratio between the M1s and M2 that at early time points, again, this is not a this is not a biofilm model. This is a clean wound model. So you're not going to see much difference at days 14, but at day 7 when the bacteria are there, you see a reduction in, a, uh, in, in the ratio that's beneficial towards um, a healthy amount of inflammation. We also saw increased cell proliferation and granulation tissue formation. You can see the difference in these, in these histological slides in these diabetic mice. No matrix. You see this much granulation tissue formation at day 114. Look at the amount of cellularity that's increased into the matrix at day 14 um, as well. Um, the, now, we took this into in vitro and said, okay, this is an animal model. Does it also work in human cells and diabetes? Well, we, it's hard to study in humans. You can't take biopsies that much in humans, or it's not as easy to do. So we looked at this in, in, in vitro. We basically put this, these matrices in a, tissue, in a tissue culture, and we stain for these different proteins of the, uh, we get this baseline amount of staining. But when we add normal fibroblast, it's, it, it induces an augmented amount of staining of all of these matrices, laminin, glycosaminoglycans, collagen, suggesting that these cells are happy here. They are, they're living, they're secreting proteins that are in, in involved in healing. And it's interesting enough, when we added diabetic fibroblasts, which we would think would be impaired, you saw almost a near complete similarity to normal non-diabetic fibroblasts in terms of the deposition of these, health, of these good proteins for healing. Again, we saw increase in angiogenesis, and you can see it, this is the take-home message here. By day 14, you saw a tremendous increase in the amount of blood vessels that, were, um, that grew into this matrix in vitro as well. And once again, looking at tubular formation, in other words, a, 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 a um, vascular network and not just uh, individual cells, you saw that the, uh, with either normal fibroblasts or diabetic fibroblasts, you saw a healthy amount of uh, new blood vessel formation in the matrix, in the amniotic, chorionic matrix. Uh, 
Now looking at epithelialization, um, similar process, the sustaining of the keratinocytes in the top of the wound, and using the matrix, you saw a in improvement in this, but not to the same degree as you would see with the dermis. So all of these were beneficial for granulation tissue formation, for a lot of other uh, um, cell processes involved in wound healing. Um, it did enhance, enhance epithelialization, but not to the same degree as our dermal products. Um, and finally, I think, or one of the few, last few slides, looking at the keratinocytes in vitro, um, there seems to be something that's secreted in this matrix. So even when you put a barrier, you put the cells on top here, you put the matrix at the bottom, you put cell culture fluid here, tissue culture medium here, there seems to be something secreted into the matrix that supports growth of both normal keratinocytes as well as diabetic keratinocytes, at least, um, at least in this model system. So again, Regeneration is what we're all looking for. And although I'm not claiming that these products cause regeneration or something, but I do want you to see some of the pictures that are seen by my colleagues later. Uh, that, and, and you look at the quality of the healing of the tissues after treated with these amniotic products and these dermal products. But essentially, by reducing scarring, and this is our holy grail in plastic surgery and in, in, in regenerative medicine, we, we, in order to regenerate tissues, you have to decrease scar formation. Um, it's, it, it, and, and so if you look at markers of fibrosis, of scarring, um, it, 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 proteins involved in myofibroblast accumulation, collagen deposition, um, and, and collagen tissue growth factor deposition, you, saw, you see in all of these that there seems to be a decrease in, with the chorionic me me membrane um, as compared to controls or other types of membrane. And I think this is very important in terms of reducing fibrosis and inducing a regenerative process. So what does it do in terms of the processes that we mentioned in terms that are important for wound healing, uh, inflammation modulation, granulation tissue formation, et cetera, all of these processes, it turns out that you can check off the mark. The amniotic chorionic membranes are improve this as compared to standard of care. So in conclusion, I think um, this is a product or a technology or a technique or a tool that you can use when you want to increase processes that are important in healing, uh, whether it's blood vessel formation, reducing uh, scarring, uh, improving um, epithelial, epithelialization, reducing inflammation. Um, this seems to address all of these areas that are important for healing. And so if you look in terms of, you know, again, going back to amnion, and, and, and this addresses questions we all have. When do I use one versus the other? We, we don't know that for sure yet, but perhaps it's possible that if you look at the dermal matrices, perhaps we can use this in areas that are deeper, um, that, um, that basically just need reapplization. Uh, whereas we can use the amniocorneic membrane uh, dressings in areas where we have a lot of inflammation. By reducing the inflammation, we increase granulation tissue formation. And then after that, perhaps applying a dermal product or vice versa to, to improve epithelization. So there, it, this gives us ideas for how to be good clinicians, kind of take from our toolbox, mix and match in a way that now makes logical sense uh, as opposed to just saying, let's just try one if the other's not working. So with that being said, uh, let's look at some examples. Thank you. I'm so glad I have this part. Those are very good. Thank you, Karen and Brian. Um, so uh, Brian mentions, uh, my name is Joe Larson, I'm a podiatrist from New York City. Um, and the more I talk, the more you'll realize that I'm from New York City. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm here to do real life. Um, there'll be a couple of uh, science slides in there, but not too many, but I'm here to do uh, real life. So. Um, I have a regular podiatry practice and I do wounds two days a week, um, mostly in New York City. So I have a very kind of diverse population of patients that I deal with. So let's get right into it. Let's get to a venous leg ulcer that presented to the emergency room. 58 year old male with a non-healing wound with elevated white count and inflammatory markers, but with negative uh, advanced imaging, x-ray and MRI. So um, we took this patient to the operating room and, and debrided this and did not start the patient on antibiotics to get some, some good wound cultures. And um, A1C was 5.5, so uh, we were good with that. So let's just talk about venous leg ulcers one second, and then I'll get back into the real life stuff. As previously mentioned, venous leg ulcers are the most common lower extremity ulcers, compromising about 70%. And there's a, a very big cost uh, to the healthcare um, 
world with Venus leg ulcers. So Brian mentioned a study that came out last year about venous leg ulcers and do they heal with standard of uh, care uh, compression alone or do they need advanced wound therapies? Well, back in the early 2000s, Margolis looked at that and basically said that venous leg ulcer healing rates were as low as 30% in 24 weeks with standard of care alone and promoted advanced wound therapies to aid in resuming the normal wound healing cascade to get us out of that inflammatory phase and get us into the proliferative phase. So, you know, 20 years later, the numbers are still the same um, with standard of care. So these therapies are necessary. So here, let's get back to our guy who came into the emergency room with large venous leg ulcers. We took him in, debrided, and what I usually do is I'll take cultures. Um, I didn't feel the need to do a bone biopsy here. Um, that could be a question because even though the inflammatory markers were up, there was no evidence of any type of bone infection on advanced imaging. So we took tissue cultures instead and sent it. So we debrided this and applied um, a dermal skin substitute here. Um, and one of the things I'll mention is the size of this wound. It's 600 square centimeters on the anterior aspect of the leg. And at the medial side, it was about 28 square centimeters. So I do take measurements. And if anybody who was in the uh, early, I guess, inauguration speech, they were, he was kind of mocking the use of rulers. I still use rulers. So you'll see. You'll see. They're coming up. So here's our swab, uh, polymicrobial infection, uh, infectious disease consult, because I too consult everybody, um, and just polypharmacy really to treat this and, and some fungal component too. So what you want to look at here and what I really want to emphasize is what the graph looks like as we go on, as I debride and as I apply. And what you want to see is incorporation and adherence of the graph down to the ulcer base. Because if you don't see that and it's loose, then it's just not going to work. So there is some incorporation here. As you can see on the slide on the left in the proximal wound, you, you're starting already to get some red, beefy granulation tissue. There's still some necrotic tissue there, especially in the distal one, but this is only five days post-op. Trying to find the pointer here. Pointer? You have a pointer? There we go. All right, good. Last lecture, my pointer didn't work. So that's another story. So this is 10 days post-op, and you know, what do you do now? So what I do is I really just do standard of care. Uh, but he had things to do. Um, this 58 some odd male who came to the emergency room in New York City who was homeless, um, had things to do, so he left. And here we go a couple weeks later, comes back, and you can see, not as bad as the first time, but kind of what we did is undone. We have a full thickness wound here down to subcutaneous tissue with even some structural visualization there of, of tendons. Um, so what do we do? We go back to the OR. Three weeks later, we're debriding. Second application. Normally when I do what I try to do is I try to do one application. Excuse me. And you'll see as we go on, um, sometimes you need to do more than one application. My feeling is if you can do one application and create dermis, then you really don't need to use dermal grafts anymore. You can move on to something else, other advanced wound therapies. So we took him back in. Um, he completed his course of antibiotics, and this is what it looks like. So sharp debridement in the OR down to bleeding healthy tissue. Blood supply was not an issue in this gentleman from an arterial standpoint. And we converted an infected wound to a non-infected wound with debridement, with antibiotic course, and you know what I believe advanced wound therapies do help uh, in fight that infection as well as multiple studies have shown. So I think you know the size really hasn't changed that much, but the appearance has. Now we use this second application of the graft, and what I love about this 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 graft is the fact that it can expand to 150 percent of its size. So you can use a graft on bigger wounds than you would think, and it's open cell. It really just lays there and it allows tissue to incorporate into the graft, also allowing drainage and not letting wounds to get clogged up. So it really becomes the patient's tissue. It doesn't just perform a process, it really becomes their tissue. So we'll move on. This is after the second application, and if you look now, you can really start to see tissue incorporating into this graft. The picture on the right is the medial ulcer, which is decreasing in size. And now even on the picture on the left, the proximal ulcer, you can really see some nice granulation tissue forming and a little bit more of a skin island in between those two. 
What you'll also notice here is what I do, I kind of play around with this a little bit if the graft isn't big enough or, or if, you know, I cut it and I'll put it in different directions here. So you don't have to just lay this on. You can cut it and kind of piecemeal it together if you need to, which is great. And as previously mentioned, you know, this really does form a true dermal scaffold. I think this study was already talked about and how it promotes um, angiogenesis by the recruitment of endothelial cells, how it promotes extracellular matrix formation through migration of fibroblasts, and ultimately we need dermal tissue for keratinocyte migration to form skin. And this tissue is really shown to do that. So here's two weeks post second application compared to initial application before he had somewhere to go. And you can really see the difference between the type of tissue, the size of the wounds, and um, you know, just the healthiness of the tissue. And, you know, there's, you see the staples? It's interesting. People always ask me when I take staples out. I don't really have an answer for that. I leave them in for a week or two. I leave them in for a month or two, maybe when they start to disappear. Or as you can see here, um, you know, you can see where the wound used to be. So it also helps me show where the wound used to be, even with my ruler that I still use. <laughs> so it, it's, it's helpful for me too, because you know, I'm just not as smart as some other people. So this is what I do. But anyway, here's the tissue. Look at how healthy this is. Look at how the graft incorporated. And you can really see some healing here. If you remember, the original dimensions of this wound was about 600 square centimeters. Um, and now we're down to about 79 in those anterior wounds. Okay, so we're really making some good progress here. Um, not full closure, but he had somewhere to go. So... We'll get into a diabetic wound who had a sprained ankle and developed an infected compartment syndrome that didn't really go diagnosed because he was kind of walking around to other holistic doctors in Lower Manhattan. And we have a bunch of them in Lower Manhattan. We have an interesting population and an interesting uh, diverse healthcare, um, I guess, say, practitioners. So he presented to the emergency room with an elevated white count, an A1C, and immediately went to the emergency room for an incision and drainage. So cultures taken, showed uh, staph infection superficially, and I did bone biopsy this because of the depth. So what you're looking at here is you're really looking at the periosteum of the medial side of the tibia. And right in here is that ankle joint. So bone biopsy, bone biopsy, both came back negative, interestingly enough. So what do we do next? So more advanced wound therapies, right? Negative pressure wound therapy in the OR to try to stimulate some granulation tissue and wait for intra-op biopsies to come back, all right? They weren't back yet. I kind of just included that in the first side. They don't get back that quickly, as we know. So here we go, post-IND and negative pressure wound therapy one week. Um, you can really see, you know, some nice tissue here forming uh, around, you know, red granulation tissue. Still looking at some periosteum here. We decided to take it back to the OR and apply dermal skin substitute. And again, what I want everybody to really look at here uh, the real life stuff is what these look like when you put them on and what happens. So look at this incorporation of the graft becoming patient's native tissue or new tissue, I should say. So this is a, a pretty extensive wound that kind of looked like that, negative pressure wound therapy, one application of graft, and then just standard of care with more advanced wound therapies. And what you see here is a, a, a continuous delivery of oxygen to the wound, which I use as my dressing sometimes to help facilitate a, um, a closure of wounds. And a little more therapy, and there you go. So that's pretty good, because the vascular surgeon wanted to cut his leg off, which I understand, but I think you have to give these people a chance, because we know what happens when people get their legs cut off, right? So we were happy about this. We were happy about this. I saw this guy driving down here from New York on the side of the road, so. <laughs> I figured I'd incorporate him into my lecture. So here's another diabetic patient. This diabetic patient has a history of vascular disease and osteomyelitis who had a failed transmetatarsal amputation who we had to take back for debridement and advanced wound therapy. So why is this important, right, like I just mentioned? So I think there was a quote or there was a reference to Armstrong's article in the New England Journal of Medicine. And if you're talking about wounds, you really have to incorporate an Armstrong slide, because if you don't, then you're really not just reading anything. So, you know, back in the day in 2000, I think in 11, in Wound Journal, he first talked about the five-year mortality rates and compared them to cancer. And then he again revisited this in 2017 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And he talked about the most frequently recognized complication of diabetes is a diabetic foot ulcer. 
and also stated that about 20% of diabetics will develop an ulcer, 50% will get infected, and 25% of these will require an amputation. Now, when you think about amputation, you know, we say take a toe or take some toes to save the leg to save the life. Well, I'm going to show you something in a second that, you know, sometimes taking a toe has a, well, it does, has a increase in uh, um, mortality as well. He also looked at the recurrence rate of diabetic foot ulcers, which is very interesting, right, because he really compares this to cancer in so many ways, and even the economics of it, which I'll talk about in a second, um, and 40% recurrence within a year, 60 in three years, and 65% within five years. So our job is not just to close wounds, but to help them not occur again. So in 2020, he came back in, in the Journal of Foot and Ankle Research, looked at the direct cost of diabetes in 2017 in our country, and it was about $237 billion, where the direct cost of cancer was about $80 billion. Interestingly enough, a third of all diabetic costs was related to, low, to, was related to the lower extremity. Going a little further, the funding for diabetic foot ulcer remains much less compared to cancer research, right? So that's a little disturbing when we look at the fact that if you lose a toe and he broke down the amputation and the contribution to that, that really contributes to mortality, looking at minor amputation uh, here, which was basically below the ankle, as opposed to major amputation. So even if you lose a toe, or a couple of toes, or you have a transmetatarsal amputation, your mortality rate in five years is close to 50%. So that's pretty scary. So let's get back to our guy who you may have forgot about, the 91-year-old osteomyelitic patient with diabetes and PVD. Um, if you remember the first graph that I put on, I'm just gonna jump back here a second to my horse. Look at the depth of that wound right there and how the graft is really just pushed in and then we're oops, sorry and then we're going to go to here so the graft is off and again i sometimes i like to do one and done but sometimes you can't but what i want you to look at is yeah the tissue doesn't look that great but look at the depth look at the the way that filled in in a 91 year old diabetic with vascular disease who had a now a revised transmetatarsal amputation so for me that you know pretty impressive and again you can see the staples just hanging out so here we go again, with graph number two, back to the OR, debridement, still pre-application of graft. You're seeing some nice, healthy granulating tissue. And as we move on, and as we move on, there's our progress, okay? And here we go, on to full closure with my ruler. So, so it's interesting, I, I really measure wounds kind of until the bitter end. Um, that's a small wound and most people probably wouldn't measure it. Uh, but when it comes to charting and when it comes to a whole different lecture, I really think you got to include numbers until it's, it's zero. And then you got to mention how it's fully epithelialized with no warmth or redness or fluctuance around the area because sometimes we get fooled with that stuff. So here's another diabetic. He's a 50-year-old male who I'm actively treating who had vascular intervention whose PVRs are about one, which is kind of what we want to see, right? We don't want to see 0.6 or 0.5, and we certainly don't want to see 1.4 either uh, because we know that those are non-compressible vessels. But, you know, there's no waveforms at the metatarsals, so this is one of those cases where I'm sure we're all kind of sitting here saying, I've been there and shaking our head where, you know, they had an angio and they had stenting, but there's nothing else that can be done. So you know, because the PVR was 1.02, but his metatarsal waveforms were flat. So, eh, you know. Anyway, this patient had um, um, an infectious, uh, an infectious uh, ulcer at his uh, fourth interspace on his right foot, came to the emergency room and had a uh, uh, open amputation of his um, uh, partial fourth ray, fourth digit and fourth metatarsal, and then was treated with skin substitute and negative pressure wound therapy. He left the hospital and went to subacute rehab and came back to me with his negative pressure wound therapy over his graft and it was all macerated and it was lifted and the machine was beeping and you know I was the only one that kind of knew what was going on with the machine beeping. This is a problem. These interspace infections, these, these little ulcers here or these infections here are very much a problem because it's very hard to get therapies in that area. And as a podiatrist, I'm seeing his small toe turning in. We call that an adducto varus rotation of the fifth toe, and it's just getting in the way of our healing. So I had a conversation with the gentleman, and we decided to go back in and remove his fifth toe and part of his fifth metatarsal and 
really debride it and kind of get in there and get everything out of the way so we could try to save his foot. Now, I'll tell you what I do. When you take more than one toe, for me, I'm taking all the toes. But not every patient agrees to that because if you all of a sudden are walking around with two or three toes, you're bound to break down again somewhere else underneath your metatarsals at some point in the future. So one toe, fine. Two toe, I think they all go. And I think you get a better result with a transmetatarsal amputation. But in this case, it didn't happen. As we know, patients dictate our treatment a lot of times. So here's the application of the graft intraoperatively. And this is what I do. I was asked before about, um, I was going over slides here with Doc, and he said, do you, did you use negative pressure wound therapy there? And I said, I didn't. And he said, well, how do you hold the graft down? So this is what I do. I take a saline moisten four by four, and I push it in. And I push that graft down to the ulcer base, and then I staple it. So I don't staple it and let the middle kind of pop up. I hold it down, and I staple it. And I think it adheres a little bit better. Um, maybe not textbook, but that's what I do. And you can see here, again, how the graft just kind of lays down onto the wound, and the wound is bleeding, and it's kind of healthy looking, and um, negative pressure wound therapy right over this. As I mentioned that I don't always do it, but sometimes I do. This was a deep wound, so white foam, black foam, and negative pressure wound therapy right over the graft. Another thing that's great about this graft is that it's strong, and it can really hold up to negative pressure wound therapy. So this is three days later, dressings off, still doesn't look that great. I'm not so optimistic about this gentleman, unfortunately, but we're trying. And I, it's, it's important to try because the data says that, you know, when, when you get a proximal amputation or, or continual amputations, um, the prognosis is poor. So wounds are tough. They're tough. So yeah, if only they were all like this. <laughs> yeah. So we, we just, uh, my last slide that I kind of didn't lead into there is you really don't want any regrets. So, you know, not even one. That's it. Thank you. All righty, in the next, what, 20 minutes, I'll try to get through about 100 slides and 15 cases. I'm just kidding. Um, but again, I appreciate, I mean, a terrific discussion. Dr. Galliano, I've never heard so much science about the, the tissue forms that I'm using, but, but honestly, it really, for the audience, I mean, it's important because we really are science-based and we have to be uh, in this world of technology. So again, the one thing I do want to sort of re-verbalize uh, re, um, is that this idea of processing matters. We have lots of dish, uh, tissue forms on the market. The idea of making sure that the tissue is processed correctly, and so uh, these tissue forms we're talking about have been aseptically processed. That means that there's no terminal sterilization. The benefit of that is that we're not altering those matrix proteins that we're trying to utilize to get wounds to heal. So I'll jump into some cases. This first case is a 67-year-old gentleman. Lots of medical issues to include arterial insufficiency, diabetes, as well as uh, uh, on steroids for a severe COPD. He had undergone a TMA, uh, actually several, uh, which failed. Um, and we got him to a point after some uh, wound bed preparation with local wound care that the wound looked pretty good. And so from my standpoint, again, I'm a plastic surgeon, but I do also do wound care. And as I see this gentleman, who of course did not want any more surgery if we could avoid it, um, that's me sitting uh, at the office uh, exam room uh, table, and I think I, I need this to heal, and I need it to heal as quickly as possible. So what can I do to expedite the healing? So the um, amnion chorion uh, dehydrated uh, allograft is what I utilized here. And I utilize this in conjunction with negative pressure. As you'll see, I use a lot of negative pressure in my practice, and I think that the effects are um, not only additive, but exponential. So you get that synergy, which really helps uh, uh, the other to do their best. So this is, again, weekly application of this uh, amnion chorion, and then we were able to get him to heal. Um, so when do we do surgical intervention for lower extremity ulcers? You know, typically I, I have the advantage that I work with a lot of wound care partners and wound care clinicians. Usually when they come to me, they've already been worked up. As Karen mentioned, making sure whether it's venous uh, in etiology versus arterial or a combination, all of the sources of the problem need to be addressed. But when do I consider surgical intervention? Number one, sometimes the wound is just not healing. 
Uh, we need to do something to, as it's stalled, and we need to kind of expedite or uh, re-energize that wound. Um, think about what the goals of the therapy are. I think uh, Dr. Galliano mentioned that it's important to recognize that what, what you're trying to do, you have to have a goal of therapy. And depending on what your goal of therapy, that will determine what your next move is. Um, sometimes for me, it is a surgical intervention for closure, but sometimes it's simply to get the wound to a point that I can achieve secondary closure. And then, of course, the how. When do I do a split thickness skin graft? When do I do flaps? Um, the big issue with the split thickness skin graft versus the human reticular uh, dermal matrix, many times it's whether or not I'm going to plan to do an autologous graft. It's if I have a deep wound, maybe bone or tendon exposed, and I need that additional soft tissue scaffolding and or support so that I don't have a skin graft directly on tendon and or bone. And other times, in terms of what uh, the other tissue product, again, the amnion chorion, I'm simply trying to optimize my ability to heal. So another case, 72-year-old gentleman, he did have both arterial and venous uh, insufficiency. My wound care partner was trying to debride this in clinic, which you can imagine really wasn't getting, making any progress. So we brought him to the operating room for a surgical debridement. Uh, this is him on the table, and then we utilized negative pressure with installation for wound bed preparation. Kept him in the hospital for 72 hours. Now, if you look at this wound, while it looks cleaner, you can see it's still pretty fibrotic. And in all honesty, it was a little early for me to do a, an autologous skin graft, but I really wanted to get him healed. Um, he had, uh, uh, again, things to do and was uh, threatening leaving AMA from the hospital. So I decided to proceed with an autologous skin graft. With that graft, I also placed the amnion chorion uh, uh, allograft. So as you can see here, uh, this is the graft in place. This is the amnion chorion as a mini membrane that's on top of my graft. And then we use a non-adherent layer uh, followed by uh, wound, uh, negative pressure wound therapy. So left the hospital, uh, kept the dressing in place for seven days. And to my surprise, the split thickness skin graft actually looked quite good. So what are we looking at? Again, the graft is adherent. You can see the swelling in the uh, lower extremity is uh, much decreased. So I was, it was very promising that we were going to get this to heal. And indeed, we did. Now, a comment on this, that this is one of my first cases that I use a split thickness skin graft in the amnion chorion. And what really was remarkable to me is this split thickness skin graft with a one and a half one and a half to one mesh. It looked more similar at six weeks than what I typically see it more like six months to a year. And what do I mean by that? Dr. Galliano mentioned the increase in cellular proliferation, reepithelialization, and remodeling. And that's why I think this um, skin graft looks more mature than we would typically see at, at six weeks. So here's another case. This is a 69-year-old uh, female who presented uh, with uh, a lower extremity. She actually had a charcoal deformity and venous stasis disease. She was actually being followed in the wound clinic and came in with this acute change of her wound, which included a lot of necrotic debris, which tells me right away there's some evidence of infection. So we admit her to the hospital, and this is something that has kind of changed in my practice, but rather than going directly to the operating room, I started her on negative pressure wound therapy with installation instead of doing that initial debridement, and this was able to loosen up a lot of that debris, as you can see, in 48 hours. Uh, another um, few days, we continue negative pressure therapy. Now the wound looks pretty good. We have her on IV antibiotics, um, and now we can proceed with autologous skin grafting. So again, just debridement in the operating room, uh, my autologous graft with the um, amnion chorion mini membrane. Negative pressure therapy post-op. Uh, and again, she uh, did quite well and was able to heal uneventfully. So what about those cases where we have a um, little deeper tissue exposed? So this is a patient had previous sarcoma, radiation therapy, not to the foot, but to that leg. Uh, so she had some arterial insufficiency as well as radiation changes to the um, uh, anterior or proximal leg. But she actually presented with what we thought was a venous uh, ulcer related, uh, but you can see deep soft tissue exposed as well as uh, bone exposed. So initially taking her to the operating room, uh, debridement, again, you can have a close-up uh, view here of that bone that is exposed. And prior to anything is that you got to get down to bleeding tissue to include bleeding bone. And so this, I use a burr just simply to get down to that nice uh, uh, punctate bleeding. She's continued. Sorry, um, 
So on day three, now the wound look, actually looks pretty good, and so we actually continued her on a, I'm sorry, that video is not playing, but that is a mini membrane being placed on the wound bed to include the bone. And this is a little bit different. Many times people ask, do I want to put that mini membrane of the amnion, there we go, amnion chorion on, uh, you know, beneath the graft or on top of the graft. And I think if you use, because it's a mini membrane, it's not a big layer, so it's not going to interfere with that graft take. And I did want to do what I could to try to um, uh, get that wound bed prepared for a potential allograft. So uh, here we are placing our, uh, our reticular dermal matrix. Again, the mini membrane is placed uh, uh, underneath the graft and followed by graft and then additional mini membrane and the negative pressure wound therapy. So she actually did quite well. Um, this is at seven days again. She's discharged from the hospital after her surgery. And then what's most important is the area where the bone is exposed is already adherent. And so we were able to continue her on negative pressure therapy. And ultimately, uh, she received an autologous graft. Here's another case, 72-year-old gentleman, also a venous stasis disease. You can see he also had uh, kind of semi-charcoal deformity, uh, multiple ulcers. He was taken uh, to the operating room uh, for debridements, uh, and then that was followed by, uh, again, negative pressure therapy with installation. For it back after 72 hours, uh, again, we have a little area of bone exposed. And again, when I see deep soft tissue loss and or bone or tending exposure, um, that's when I start considering uh, using my uh, dermal scaffold. So again, the mini membrane of amnion chorion is placed, uh, followed by the reticular dermal matrix. So he was continued uh, with negative pressure postoperatively, and I want to continue this to allow that scaffold to build up my soft tissue, and that's what I did. And so uh, this is uh, just a few days after surgery. Again, the graft is adherent, and then we continued him uh, for about uh, five weeks more outpatient, and then we could then bring him back now with a fully incorporated graft um, for autologous skin grafting. Again, the mini membrane, amnion chorion on top, and then followed by negative pressure wound therapy. Went on to heal uh, uneventfully. In the last case, this is a 50-year-old gentleman, again, Charcot deformity, um, a heel ulcer. And, and I always say, you know, I see a lot of pressure ulcers stage four, wounds the size of my head. Heel ulcers scare me more. And why? Because there's not a lot of soft tissue for me to work with. And so this gentleman, nicest guy, but he looked like Santa Claus. He's about 300 pounds and very noncompliant. Um, but he, or sorry, not adherent. Um, but, but he came in, uh, uh, we brought him to the operating room to try to expedite the healing uh, of this ulcer. So I actually marked out a, a rotational flap, robbing Peter to pay Paul so we could get coverage over that deep soft tissue, which we knew extended to the bone. So uh, this is the flap being mobilized. This was followed by this, I'm just showing the area where the bone went to the level of bone. Um, and one of the things I did here is I also utilized a um, adipose matrix. And so this is another um, tissue form, again, by our sponsors, um, MTF Biologics, which allows soft tissue support and specifically fatty tissue replacement. And that's one of the issues with any area of pressure-related injury. So I proceed with my um, uh, local flap, and then the amnion chorion is placed prior to closure, um, and then negative pressure is utilized uh, postoperatively. Uh, one of the things I want to mention here, again, I mentioned he's a bigger guy, and if you notice, most of my uh, slides were had this nice blue towel and background. And then on this one, my uh, anesthesiologist, it's always bad when there's a lot of activity behind the anesthesia drape. And so uh, they were having problems with his airway. And so my uh, superb nurse was able to get the negative pressure um, incisional management dressing in place and got, got a, a quick picture. But hence, it's not quite as uh, pretty as our others. Uh, but this is uh, now um, one, one week follow up. Um, number one, you can see very macerated. And uh, I knew it was a bad sign when our, my patient came in and he had cut the back tubing uh, because it was difficult for him to walk on the foot because of the tubing. And so he's been walking on the foot. He now has a negative pressure device in place that is not functioning and hence the maceration. Uh, so we lectured him on some adherence and so he did a little bit better the next week but you can see, see we still have a macerated foot but most important the skin flap still seems viable. So we continued him with more negative pressure therapy. This is a disposable unit uh, that we have available in our clinic. 
Uh, three weeks, it looks a little bit better. It's still relatively close. He's walking on it a little bit less, uh, but finally at six weeks, um, it's looking like the flap is going to survive, and then at three months, uh, he was able to heal. Um, so in summary, you know, surgical in, uh, intervention for chronic lower extremity also certainly may be beneficial, uh, but determining the when, why, and how is really key to success. Um, as Dr. Galliano mentioned, the human reticular um, acellular uh, dermal matrix has properties that allow for this tissue integration and incorporation that can really help with soft tissue loss. While a slit thickness skin graft may be required, often that meshed reticular uh, dermal matrix may be used as a replacement and or an adjunct, an adjunct specifically when there's tendon or bone exposed. Uh, the placental allograft I utilize quite regularly. It may be useful both for wound bed preparation as well as uh, to optimize healing of your flap and graft. And finally, uh, just to consider that adipose matrix in those areas of uh, fatty tissue deficiency uh, for replacement. Thank you.